Hold still. Hold still. Hold still. Why do you do that? I'll tell you why. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode 73. I'm going to complain to the HR department. I am the HR department. Guys, welcome to episode 73. We have a saying at my school. We're going to keep it PG-13. Don't flock with the fox. All right, guys, let's get right to it. So today we have a packed program. Guys, first uh, first question we're going to ask uh, somebody on uh, YouTube yesterday. Um, yesterday's episode asked about the inverted triangle. Um, a clarification question, so we're going to go over there first. Uh, guys, don't forget, today is episode 73. Tomorrow is episode 74. That's going to be the last episode. It's going to be live on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So episode 75 starting Wednesday will be on YouTube only live we can still post links on Facebook Instagram but if you have questions you want to tune in live go subscribe on YouTube Silver Fox BJJ channel you can't miss it so guys inverted triangle the question was if the guy sits out how do I access his legs you don't the best part about it is usually, no, no, keep, keep it there. It's, it's a lot easier to ferret out his arm, okay? So if he sits out, it's a lot easier, but it, it's not, a, you know, sometimes you can't still bring it out even if you have two on one, if the guy's real strong. But the best part about it is he sits out, guys. Uh, basically, the, the uh, inverted triangle gets extremely powerful. So by, when people sit out, I, I, a lot of times when I have the inverted triangle, I hunt for the feet. And their natural reaction is to sit out. And if they don't, I'll, I'll, I'll double up on the submission. I can, you can do a modified toe hold, and at the same time, you have an inverted triangle. Uh, but when they sit out, that triangle gets turbocharged. So you don't have to hunt for the feed once they sit out, because now you just squeeze, all right? It's very difficult to escape from that position. And it's also, like I said, the, the squeeze is really on. Just they give you a perfect, perfect angle, all right? So guys, we've gotten a lot of questions on, uh, on uh, uh, crucifix. So, Mike, you look like you have a question already. <laughs> Ryan, the Sousa We didn't says... get anywhere. <laughs> okay, he had a homework, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. did he complete? Yes, he says, uh, Fox, homework submission from yesterday. The sweep from inverted triangle was in episode 34 at 10 minutes and 21 seconds. Nice. Yes, you get an A. So nice. Uh, so let's move on to guys. We're gonna talk about crucifix. We're gonna talk about the setup, but I'm gonna first explain to you what crucifix is, if you don't know. So what I usually this is the crucifix. So no, notice how gingerly I'm moving, guys. Once I get here, guys, this is the crucifix submission. Tap. Okay. This is the one time, one and only time we're going to do that today. And the reason for that is I don't like to teach crucifix. It's spinal manipulation. Okay. Uh, people that don't have good control have a tendency because once somebody is crucifixed, they cannot escape. So if you get all like, uh, you know, you're in that zone or like, I'm, I'm going after this guy, you get to that position, you immediately slow down. Okay. If you don't slow down, if you sit out hard, you can really tweak your training partner's neck. So. Long story short, I do not teach crucifix. I teach the threat of a crucifix because the threat of a crucifix leads us to a lot of good submission. So that is gonna be our episode today is rather than a crucifix, we're gonna talk about threat of a crucifix, which again will lead to a lot of good submissions 
it's, it's, a, it's a very strong form of control, and your opponent has to react in a certain way. And we know exactly how he's going to react and how we're going to nail him with, with a submission from there. Okay? So let's look at uh, the initial setup. So a lot of times when um, I'm hunting for somebody's back, uh, I can take their back or I can, you know, threaten the crucifix. If I can get my inside knee in, I will. Okay? Sometimes... If his arm is forward, I just take take it with the outside leg. All right. So whichever, if, if his arm is somewhat tucked in, you can ferret it out with the inside leg. If it's kind of flared out, you just trap it with your outside leg. Now, why did Enrique bend his arm this way? Why didn't he keep it the other way? Do we have any answers? <laughs> Too late now. <laughs> So if he keeps it, he looked through and legacy channel say arm lock. Yes. So if he keeps it under the lead leg, in this case my right leg, there's a threat of a very strong tap arm lock. Okay. That threat will cause almost every jujitsu guy to bend his arm under the inside leg. Okay, in this case, it's the left leg. So that will almost always happen. So guys, I want to make sure that you can, you can bring, so you can kind of feed the arm from one leg to the other. I kind of lost it, so I just bring, push his arm with my right leg back on, over my left leg, and now I have it where I want it, okay? So you can kind of swim your legs in a way so you hand it from one leg to the other. Now, notice that I'm shutting, so I will never open it up enough where he can swim his arm all together. So I'm really keeping my, yeah. So I'm really keeping my thighs in and controlling his arm at all times. You cannot afford to, to lose it. If you lose it, yeah, I'm not losing it. But if I lose it, go ahead and tuck it. Yeah, now I'm gonna. Now it's gonna be a lot harder. Now he knows I'm hunting for that arm. So if I have it, I will control it quite strongly. Tap. Yeah, Enrique did not bend his arm, and I just sat on it. So right now he, there's not a whole lot of places he can go. Yeah, he's happy to get to this point. Okay, this is like omoplata. Most people in omoplata will bend their arm because it allows them. To survive a little bit longer, it alleviates the pressure on the elbow. In this case, the pressure could be on the elbow, could be on the shoulder. Okay? So, at this point, I have a choice. I can either, if he stays where he is, I can take him to my right, or he takes me to my left. It doesn't matter. You will wind up in exactly the same position. All right? Guys, let's look at it again. This is very important. So I will go whichever way he decides to take me. All right? Now, notice that my left hand, in this case, before, if I was on the other side, be my right hand, is not engaged. The reason for that is, notice how he's arching his back and he's going to roll. So if, if I have a wrong angle and not my left hand was engaged, my face is going into the mat first. We don't want anything to happen to this pretty face. Just kidding, guys. <laughs> guys, you don't want to be smacking your face or your neck uh, or your top of your skull into the mat repeatedly. It's very, very bad for your neck. So that's why my left hand is floating. So as he's rolling me, so my angle is off. Go ahead. Keep on. I post, and that allows, it buys me time to change the angle so I don't go face first into the mat. All right, right now, there's a threat of a crucifix. I can do one-handed, right, I can do one-handed choke. You can do collar choke. 
You could do one-handed sort of nogi choke. So there's a lot of options, okay? Uh, one of my favorite, it depends on when his body's positioned. If his body's positioned closer to my legs, I bring the leg over and I triangle. This is an ugly looking triangle, guys, but this is extremely brutal, very effective, all right? So right now he's in a threat of crucifix, and that will cause him to move. Don't move yet. Uh, that will cause him to move because he has to move. His position is untenable. Can somebody tell me why? What would make a position untenable? Let's go back. What makes a position untenable? Not being able to attack. Ten. Uh, Aswa says neck crank. Michael Frizzi says when you have no control. I can think uh, of three three reasons right off the top of my head. John Grappler says no access to reversing your opponent. JP uh, Ledut says no control of both arms. What's untenable mean? Why didn't you ask that before? That you can't stay there. You cannot. That you cannot stay in that position. The lots of peer says it can only get worse. Adolfo Ferranda says, when you lose position and use of limbs. All right, so let's look at it, guys. There's, there's three, three possible things that make a position untenable. So one of them is very simple. Feel like I just smacked that mustache off his face. <laughs> Only half of it. Only half of it. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so it's the possibility of repeatedly being hit in the head without a, a response. So he has to move. Okay. The other possibility is pain, which usually implies a joint lock or discomfort, very strong discomfort. Okay. Um, in this case, the, the arm lock is not quite there, but the third thing is the, the, the threat of, of a choke. Okay. So again, if Enrique doesn't move, I just reach in and that's it. All right. So there's three things that in jiu-jitsu will generally make your position untenable. For those who don't know, that means you, you cannot stay in that position. It's the threat of strikes. That's one. Two is pain slash extreme discomfort, which usually implies a joint lock. And three imply a, 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 a possible threat of a choke. So in this case, I have, for jiu-jitsu, I only have one, but you know, I have a lot of chokes here. Okay? So, um, he can. He has to move. He has. To, he has no choice. He has to move. All right. If this were MMA, if this were MMA fight, I'd be pounding the crap out of him. <laughs> so he has to move, guys. Now, the only way for him to move is to slide down. Sometimes guys try to come up, and they. The reason I'm turned to him, they try to ride up. And go over. Yeah, I'm not gonna let you do that. Yeah. So they go ahead and do it again. This is one possibility. So there's a couple of ways to stop him. Is to kind of put your hand on his head so he's kind of putting pressure on himself. The other one is go ahead, just bring the leg over. So the most viable escape for him, and this is what I would recommend if you caught in this, is to slide down towards your feet and put your head. Under your, you know, in the sort of gap by your armpit. 
So, is this position untenable right now? Waiting for the replies. Only in one context it is untenable. Michael Fuzzi says yes. No. Only in MMA or self-defense is his position untenable. In jiu-jitsu, this is not, a, it, it's, it's a horrible position for him, but he doesn't have to move. Because he's, there's no pain. There is pretty much no threat of a choke. I can hit him. That's the only thing. Since we don't hit each other in jiu-jitsu, except by accident. Uh, so guys, here is a very, very simple thing. When you make your training partner slash opponent's position untenable, meaning that he cannot stay there long term, he has to move. Now, if his position is not untenable, then you have to move. Because now he can stay there, wait for you to move and make a mistake. Understand, and this is one of the, 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 the sort of, I believe, differences among a lot of different tribes of jiu-jitsu, especially, this is kind of ingrained, especially the old school guys of, of Henzo's jiu-jitsu, is we always think about the possibility of strikes. Even though we cannot strike in jiu-jitsu, uh, except by accident or unless it's combat jiu-jitsu. Uh, we always keep that in mind. So even though he is in a position that's not untenable, he should think about a possibility of getting hit. So if he's training for self-defense or MMA, which most people I think are training for self-defense, he should move. But if he's purely just training for jiu-jitsu, then you could just sit there and wait for the, for the guy on top to make a mistake or get discouraged and go home. So again, if I make his position untenable, he has to move. If he doesn't move, he will be submitted or subjected to extreme pain. Caleb Thrupp is asking, will you wait till you have the opposite wrist control before you start to isolate the near arm or is there another viable grip uh, on the far side that works for you? I, I do it almost simultaneously. So as soon as I get here, I'm already driving. I, I do it almost simultaneously. So, now he rolls. Guys, again, if he, usually they will roll over. If he doesn't, if he stays, you could always just go back and wind up in exactly the same position. Okay? So right now, Enrique's position is untenable. So he has to move. As soon as he moves, unless I can hit him, his position becomes tenable. So he can live here for a while. Alright? So what I need to do is I have to move myself. I'm not a fan of, okay, you're in a shitty position, let me hold you. If I got somebody in a crappy position, I want to put him away, okay? So how do we do that? I continue to control his arm. I'm going to bring the leg over. The outside leg comes over, and I pull myself up. Now, guys, we're going to, again, in a self-defense, Self-defense slash MMA, his position is untenable. <laughs> that was hard. <laughs> I tried to smack the mustache off <laughs> the other side. So, but in jiu-jitsu, again, it's uncomfortable, but he can wait here, all right? So usually, I have a couple of possible submissions here. You guys can see, one arm in, one arm up, one arm out. It's easy. But for that, for me to, to hit him with a triangle, I'd have to kind of lift him up and expose myself to possibly trading positions with him. So instead of doing that, guys, 
I will slide up and sit 10 minutes and just go into an arm lock. Guys, notice that my arm lock, I don't have to bring this over. If, as I hunt for this, it become, my, my right leg becomes a little bit lighter, so I personally prefer to keep it so deep that I, I can finish without bringing the leg over. You okay there? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> A non lost jiu-jitsu is asking, Coach, is it possible to take the hand out by pummeling the hand that's in between the legs if he walks with his legs? If your legs are not in proper position, yes. If your legs are in a good position, no. Pummel, we're gonna have you pummel away. Ha <laughs> ha! Now I have possibility of a mommy to unlock too, guys. Jimmy T says, hey, Fox, after yesterday's class, I had to YouTube Suzanne Summers Thigh Master commercial <laughs> for training purposes only. Of course. <laughs> it definitely helps your jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Well, guys, it certainly puts a picture of, you know, how you're supposed to squeeze your thighs together. You know, something, it's weird. Sometimes people hear and see what they're supposed to do, but they can't remember it. So I'm pretty sure that everybody's going to remember it. It's, it's such a weird exercise equipment. And Piotr is asking, do you prefer to keep your chest or hips close to his shoulder? Do you just take, or do you just take whatever he gives you? What are the pros and cons of both approaches? Um, my chest stays close to him, but my legs are most important. It's most important that I retain control over that far side arm with my legs. That's the most important thing. So he can he can easily take away. So, so he can easily take away uh, the control the where my chest is positioned. But it's important for me to retain control over this. So you can see how my legs are positioned. They, my thighs are very close to each other, so he cannot really pull out his pull out his uh, his arm. So I will bring my leg over. And then I usually, this is usually my finish. Okay. <laughs> Give us a few minutes, guys, please. Wow. It's a tough one. HR department. <laughs> so does that make sense? My most important job is to make sure I retain control of his forearm with my legs. My arm takes care of the control on the closer side. AG265 is asking professor in this way what you're saying is that uh, we should always imagine strikes in any BJJ role to improve our position, not just to stay there, not doing anything. That's an excellent point. Now, depends what, what reason you're training for. Uh, guys, understand that if you watch a black belt match at a high level, sometimes it's like watching paint dry. For 10 minutes, almost nothing happens. You know, and then a lot of times guys are inverting underneath, underneath each other and you know, uh, I've said to my students before, like sometimes when you watch, it's like, man, if I had seen this 25 years ago plus, I don't think I'd be doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But you also do need to understand that these are guys that are so closely matched up. They're looking for these tiny little advantages. Uh, that's not how they would go about things if they were to get into a, 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 a self-defense fight or MMA fight. They would double leg the guy and, and mount him and you know go with the fundamental basic principles of jiu-jitsu. So understand that, that guys that you see at a high level, 
It's not that they don't uh, they don't know, uh, you know, uh, how to how to you know that they would pull sort of guard and and uh, and try to sort of invert underneath the guy if, if the guy is about to, to pound them. Uh, but uh, most important uh, reason for you to think about is what's the reason you're training? You know, if uh, if you're training for uh, uh, for uh, competition, jiu-jitsu is just grappling where you don't worry, have to worry about the striking, your outlook is going to be a little different and sort of the way you're going to look at positions and you look, you look at techniques is going to be a little different. Now, if you're training for self-defense or MMA, then you have, if you're in trouble, if your position is untenable, uh, and from a striking perspective, you got to move. You got to move. And the sooner you move, the better it is. Um, the other thing is, uh, even if you just purely train from a grappling perspective, if I'm in Enrique's position and I get, you know, I'm basically dominated, I will try to move. Because I want, now, there's, there's a different, uh, different principle, a different sort of motivation for me to move. So my motivation to move is not, instead of uh, moving because he might be pounding my face with his fist, is, is now I, I'm trying to get it. He's a step ahead of me. I'm trying to take that step away and, and bring momentum to my side. And I, so then I still advocate moving even if you're not, you know, um, not, not worried about getting hit in the face. Uh, so it's just a different approach, but and different motivation. But so I'm always a fan of, of taking the initiative. Uh, but if if you're training for self defense, you really like any position that you feel like you could be repeatedly hit in the face is untenable. You got to move. You got to find a way out. Okay. Jared Kirby is asking, would you use the same movement to possibly hit the Tarico Plata or arm lock? Tarico Plata is not my move so you should look at Tarika Plata there's a video very comprehensive all the different setups so the answer is for me no but there is setups uh, from crucifix you know to to Tarika Plata but that I point you to that video um, the Siege Pack is asking coach in what situations would you go for the crucifix instead of guillotine slash back tick uh it's generally if I'm north south, I'm I'm going the guillotine's anaconda. So if, if the guy turtles up and I'm here, I'm gonna go for. A, why do you see your hand already on my <laughs> on, on my wrist? Because there's no HR department. Huh? <laughs> there's no HR department. I have to. <laughs> Give us a minute, guys. No. Give us a minute. <laughs> My grip is not the best, but we'll work. Yeah. I was trying to fake go to sleep, and oh. you didn't let me go. <laughs> <laughs> we did an HR department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to lodge a complaint. He's already countering me before I even have a chance to explain it to you guys. Sorry. <laughs> Get your ass back. <laughs> so... So if he, if he's if he's turtled up and I'm north south, I will attack guillotines slash anacondas bravo chokes. Okay. If I'm here, I will. If I can weave in, I have a choice. Right now, to be honest with you, if I can ferret out his arm, I would go with the crucifix threat. Okay. If I cannot ferret out his arm, if he keeps it tucked in, I'm gonna do it back. All right, so if I'm on the side, so I, I try to attack as efficiently as possible. So if I'm north-south, I'll attack a guillotine slash anaconda slash, um, you know, dars. Uh, so basically, one-arm guillotines, you know, bravo chokes, uh, guillotine, regular guillotine, whatever. Uh, if I'm perpendicular to him, I will attack the back. If I can isolate the arm, I will go with the threat of a crucifix. I believe that is the hardest one to escape. A lot of Pierre is asking, in one of your clips, you go against a big guy and catch him numerous times with the crucifix. Do you always catch him from the turtle or do you get it from other positions also? You can get it from other positions, but turtle is probably the sort of the easiest to set it up. You, you know, once you sort of start to get, get uh, I, I usually try to control his arm 
or his head with my legs. I, I either tried to control it with my arms or with my legs. So once you le learn how to sort of um, start to isolate, to number one, look for it and start to isolate the arm or head and arm with your legs if your arms are otherwise occupied, you will see it, uh, you will see it, uh, uh, you will see it sort of from a lot of other positions. Yeah, that's a, that's a role we did with uh, Ryan. I think at the time he was a pro belt. He's a, he's a good black belt now. Uh, it's a couple of years, maybe five years old, six years old, something like that. So, uh, yeah, it's on our YouTube. Everything's on our YouTube channel, guys. That's why we're moving everything to YouTube. Basically, we think it's going to be better quality. Uh, so we don't have, instead of a trio of devices, we're going to have one device that's got two cameras rather than one. And, and, uh, and also, but then everything is going to be Everything is going to be uh, consolidated, so if, if you're looking for any other cross-references, everything will be there. Legacy Channel is asking, Professor, as you develop your sub-series, did you do so by being put into the same situation and dealing with it, or find and chase a sub that you like and try to perfect it? Uh, I do a little bit of both. That's a, that's a good question. I do a little bit of both. I always try to perfect my submissions, but I train with a lot of good guys. Right now, because of the virus... You know, basically training with with Enrique and and, and uh, you know Mike because you know he's he's too close anyways already. So, uh, but um, normally I train with with a, a, I always like to train with the best. You know, I I you know it's about twelve years ago I wound up going against uh, Cabrinha in, in in the earlier you know not in the earlier but sort of. Uh, in the quarterfinals and semifinals in, in Pan Ams and the world. And people, oh, it's a shame that you had to go with, uh, with him, you know, rather than the final or something. And, and you know, my view is, no, I'd rather, I, I, want, I, want, to, I want to feel the best. I want to try to, because that's, it, win or lose, if you lose, then you, you, you know what, what you got to work on. So I always try to perfect my technique. Um, and uh, Cabrinha at the time, when he was in his prime, he was winning world championships, you know, Gini Nogi, you know, ADCC and so forth. But anyways, I always like to go with the best guys because if, if I catch them with something and if they ask me, like, what are you doing? I'm happy to explain it to them because if they can now start countering me, that means I either got to make my move better or it's just that move has to now have a better follow. So it's constantly driving my, my game forward in – in terms of technical development, and that's both to try to make make it more precise, but also to make you know come up with logical follow ups to to defenses. Uh, MRQZ Wizard is asking, uh, what fighters do you feel have the highest level of jujitsu in MMA right now? Uh, well, the question is whether they're still active or not. I mean. You know, Aljamain Sterling, is, is, his jiu-jitsu is very good. Obviously, the Diaz brothers, the jiu-jitsu very good. George, George is, you know, uh, his jiu-jitsu is phenomenal. You know, I've, I've, I've trained with him. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really good jiu-jitsu. You know, my sentimental favorite is Damian Maya. You know, his jiu-jitsu is, is, is awesome. Uh, Gunnar Nelson from Iceland, his, his jiu-jitsu is, 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 is great. Uh, who am I missing? Yeah, shit, Gary. You know, I, you know, I'm, I was thinking more. Uh, Gary Tonin. You know, uh, obviously he's uh, was one FC. I'm not sure if he's still one FC. Uh, uh, Naaman, Naaman Gracie. He's Bellator right now. It's you know his Jiu Jitsu is phenomenal. Very aggressive guys. Uh, you know, Hodger fought MMA. So there's a lot of fighters, guys, that have really, really good uh, Jiu Jitsu. Ryan Hall. His Jiu Jitsu is phenomenal too. And you know. Uh, there are guys who maybe kind of offensively, uh, their you know knowledge of jujitsu maybe blue purple belt level, but their defensive or their their movement is amazing. Kevin Lee being one of them, you know, uh, trained with him up in uh, in, in, in TriStar uh, in January, and and you know just the guys you think you got him on the ropes and <laughs> he escapes. So there's a lot of good jujitsu, but there's also a lot of bad jujitsu. Those I'm not gonna name. Like where guys. You're like screaming at the TV. If if he made like one slight change, you know he would have submitted the guy in the first or second round. Instead, he's slogging through five rounds of, of of you know, brain buster strikes. 
Did I miss anybody that that? Uh, did you mention Damian Maya already? Or no. oh, you did. You're not listening to me, Mike. Are you? I'm, t- I'm trying you to answer questions at the same time. Of course, Henzo, but Henzo, you know, is, is a legend in in, in MMA and the Jiu Jitsu, and I don't think Henzo was a, will ever retire. So he's, I would still consider him up there as well. <laughs> Charles Oliveira, they said. Huh? Charles Oliveira. Yes, he's, he's really excellent Jiu Jitsu. Yeah. But you saw that that fight with uh, with Kevin Lee, like you know, there were spots where a normal jiu jitsu guy would have been done, but you know, Kevin Lee took took it away until he made one slight mistake. You know, he's that day. He, Kevin has has a bright future, I believe, in MMA. Yeah. And the last two questions before we close out. Uh, Matthias G. As apologies if it's off subject. This is more of a general strategy question. Do you adjust your overall strategy when grappling against a strong judoka slash wrestler? If yes, what do you do? Yes. Um, with a good judo guy, I will try to hunt for superior grips quickly. If he gets superior grips on me standing, I will pull. I will pull guard. Because once he gets superior grips, it's just a matter of time before you're going to be flying. And with judo guys, you tend to be flying. With good wrestlers, I try to, I, I, I generally, like, uh, you know, at Henzo's, we get a lot, of, a lot of really, really good wrestlers, like elite, world-class elite. I will stand, and I will, be take, I will let them take me down. Not let them take me down. They do it pretty much, you know, once they <laughs> decide to do it. You know, you got a elite guy, it's like literally a blink of an eye. But what I'm trying to do is as they're taking me down, because with judo guys, you tend to fly head first into the mat. With wrestlers, you tend to go sort of backwards. So I'm, I'm more comfortable, you know, uh, is, is going backwards because the chance of really, really bad injury is much less. But um, I try to get a favorable grip off the takedown and then utilize it against them. So that, I don't know how that if that makes sense because again, you want to try to neutralize or minimize your opponent's strengths and take them into the areas where they're weaker than you are. Uh, and Kanai Kiyoshi rephrases Richard's question, which is how to deal with an opponent who is very good in turtle position with no clear openings. <laughs> Now, which context are we talking about? Uh, MMA? Jiu-jitsu. Oh. Are you sure it's not MMA? No. You can show both. No. <laughs> what are you getting talked apart, but... I can send an email for you, Enrique. <laughs> now, self-defense? <laughs> Give me a freaking opening. Now, there's guys that are really good at this, you know, uh, uh, pre- <laughs> no, op- open up, do it, do it really good. No, not like this. Hide your elbows. You know, uh, Pre Mickelson is really, really um, good. Has some um, instructionals on how to really prevent somebody from getting any advantageous position. A lot of times when, when I have somebody in the turtle that I cannot open up, um, it's a very interesting. With the gi, it's a little bit, a little bit easier because you could just yank. You could just yank. Okay. Um, so. Uh, if you got somebody that's really good at defending, but also taking advantage advantage of your movement, that at some point they will move when they feel you moving, trying to bust out through that opening. So one of the things, so if I'm squared up and, I, and the guy doesn't open up, I will cir- ci- uh, circle towards one side, and then I'm going to make a big back step. Nogi, I would grab, what is it, trapezoid? Yeah, the trap. The trap. It's a trap. With the gi, I would grab, and then I don't pull straight back. I pull sideways. Okay. Uh, sort of at a much higher level is uh, when you feel a guy uh, sort of. So as I'm, uh, sometimes the guys, they, they try to time, they try to posture up hard. So as, as they start to posture up, I'm gonna look for it. So they don't, they kinda like sit there and then, um, uh, then they try to posture up to kinda toss you off almost like, almost like they're doing a fireman carry uh, 
style of a takedown. So it depends, you know, what the guy is doing. You know, if the guy is just, just sitting there, not doing anything, a lot of times they will fold. So if they just, if, if, so if I'm here and they try to fold, I try to beat their legs, you know. Uh, so it depends exactly what he intends to do with that position, how he intends to get away from it. So uh, there's a couple of different scenarios. Uh, like I said, the, the coolest one is the back, back step. It works very well. Uh, it usually surprises people. The other one is just to, uh, you know, like I said, is, is if the guy decides to just kind of try to, try to posture up to toss you off, so I will just pivot around and arm lock. Hopefully arm lock the daylights out of them. Again, guys, I try to create movement out of stationary positions. Because for me, for my game, movement is where the opportunities are created. And we'll actually fit one more. A good question to close out on. Professor, in order to improve, should we train more with people who are better than us or not? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, I don't know, you know, there's one of my students in particular. Guys, it depends where you are in the pecking order. So, for example, if you're a white belt, everybody's going to be better than you, almost. So, you're going to basically work in your defense. When you get to purple belt, you know, a blue belt, you start to work a little bit of offense. When you're a blue belt, you should have a balanced game. You need to work, you, you still have to improve your defense and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and offense. When you get, a, get to a purple belt, you're still going to be, and guys, at, at, at all points of your career. It's a never-ending career, guys. Uh, in jiu-jitsu, you should be working both both aspects. You know, right now, obviously, I work a lot of my offense. When I'm training with him, I always, uh, either one of these guys, I always get a chance to work my defense too. So you want to train both, but it depends. Like, say, for example, if you're a high-level purple belt about to move to br uh, brown belt or, or brown belt, you can you should not train with, you, you. at that level, you should start to have a really good offense. So if your offense is below that of your defense you need to change the mix and by ch to change the mix you need to start training with with guys you know blue belts you know so you, you guys don't just take a new white belt and start beating the piss out of him that's not that's not going to help your game pick sturdy blue belts guys that are give you run for the money and if you make a mistake you get punished for it because that is the way that how you learn if you make a mistake you get punished for it okay, I should not be making that mistake. If you don't get punished for your mistakes, then you, you, know, you probably could have keep making them. So you wanna make sure that, that you start to change the mix. If you're a high level purple belt about to be a brown belt, or if you're a, 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 brown, a new brown belt, then you've got great defenses, nobody can submit you, but you can put away somebody, that, that's a major problem. You have to have a mix of the game. So at the higher levels, guys, if you are, uh, if, if uh, I, I don't think you're gonna get I think at, at purple and brown belt, you're more likely to have great defenses than, than uh, great offense and no defense, because otherwise you're going to be getting nailed all the time. So usually at that level, it's, it's usually, if, if there's an imbalance, it's usually uh, at the expense of offense. So you have to change who you're training with. So first start out with, you know, sturdy blue belts, you know, guys or, or people that give you a good run for the money. So if you make a mistake, They'll, they'll take advantage of it and you start to close those holes in your game and your offense is going to get uh, uh, built up and then you should be have a better balance in your game. Okay. I think it's it. Guys, like, share, subscribe, tag, follow. Friend. Friend. And we're moving to YouTube. No and foe. Follow. No what? No foe. Friend or foe. So guys, we're moving to YouTube starting Wednesday. Well, we'll still be on Facebook, but now it's just going to be linked to the actual videos. All right, guys, we'll see you tomorrow, episode 74. Tune in tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time.